Hello there, it's an Mufiki Wesson again, and this is a lady by CC. I like in a hardware component, and this is hardware component one. So I don't want my videos to go beyond 30 minutes. So because of that, I've decided to divide them into parts. So this is hardware component one. It means that it should expect another hardware component, and that is going to be hardware component two. Again, I have to apologize for the fact that I've not been able to be uh, consistent. And I'm grateful to all of you, those who sent me email and those who put, uh, leave comments at the end of the day. I see them and I reply to them. I'm very grateful, very, very grateful. Uh, I just have been busy writing the textbook. I'm done with one, that's another one that I'm still writing. And I'm making sure that my form for this, at the end of the day, will give me a comfortable, a better result. So yes, these are some of the reasons why I've not been able to be consistent, but I'll try my possible best to be consistent. Thank you all. So yeah, so without wasting much time, let's get into today's tutorial. So lesson objectives. I know this lesson, the students, you, the students should be able to describe the functions of hardware components of the computer system, define some terms associated with the workings of the central processing units. So lesson close, like I said, for every uh, uh, new topic, I pull up a code. I make sure that someone is motivated. There are students who need to be motivated before they learn, and the other students and who don't need any motivation. They just learn because they know they have to learn. So yes, start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. Start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. And this was said by Atta Ash. Atta Ash was an American, a professional American tennis player. And then he said, start where you are, Use what you have, do what you can. It is very, very important that wherever you are, just start something. Whatever you have at your disposal, use it and then do your best. How do I components of a computer system and their functions? But before we even look at the functions of the, uh, before we even look at the functions of hardware components, we should get to understand what hardware is. So hardware is a physical part of the computer system. The physical part of the computer system, the parts you can touch, the parts you can see, the parts you can feel. And sometimes I tell my students that the parts you can hack just for them to get the understanding. So yes, it's the physical part of the computer system. So it's a collection of the physical part of the computer system. And then this includes the computer case itself. But yes, we have a lot of hardware components. So there'll be no need to mention a computer case as a hardware component. But yeah, it includes a computer case the monitor, the keyboard. It also includes all the parts inside the computer case, such as the hard disk drive, the motherboard, the video cards, and many others, the CPU, the heat sinks, all these are hardware components because hardware components are the physical parts. So the part you can see, the parts you can touch, the tangible parts that make it work hard. We have the power supply units. The computer requires direct current to power the electronic component and to represent data and instructions. You can take your mobile phone, for instance. Without power, you cannot use your mobile phone. It has battery which supports you, but once the battery life runs down, you need to charge it. It has desktop computers and laptops also need to be charged. The difference here is that power supply for all the three devices are different. That is mobile phone, laptops, and desktop computers. The bottom line, however, is they all require power to do their jobs. So they all need power supply units. Now, power supply unit is a hardware component that supplies power to other components inside the system unit by converting an alternating current to a direct current from standard wall outlets or directly from batteries. So the power supply unit, power supply unit, power supply unit. It supplies power to other components inside the system units. But the main function or the its important function is to convert AC current to direct current. That is the main function or its important function to convert alternative current to direct current. Now you have the next component, which is slots. Slots are physical connection points on the motherboard, which allow the hardware of a computer to be expanded. Examples include RAM and then expansion cards, which were also known as the PCI slot, that's peripheral component interconnect. Now, let me talk about PCI slot. PCI slots allow you to add extra or additional uh, cards or components to the computer system. So for instance, 
if your VGA, the original VGA port that came with the computer is port, you can get another one and then slot it in, in the PCI slot. This will help you to connect your VGA cable to your monitor for you to get some visuals. In the same vein, if your Ethernet port is also sport, the one that came with the computer, the original one is port, you can get a PCI, you can get a card, which you slot into the PCI slot, and then that will also help you to connect your Ethernet cable, the twisted pair, and then you can get internet access. So yes, that is the essence or that is the use of the PCI slot or expansion slots. You can also say the expansion slot or PCI slot. So the expansion slots or the PCI slots, they use expansion cards. And an example or examples of expansion cards, we have the, uh, the graphics card, we have the sound card, we have the network interface card. All these are examples of expansion cards that you can buy and then it will help you to expand your computer. It's a, it gives more advantage or you get, you get to use. Uh, uh. Then there's another one, which is a RAM slot. With the RAM slot, it just helps you to insert the RAM and they'll be looking at RAM in the next slide. So you just have to insert the RAM into the RAM slot or inside the RAM slots. Random access memory. Random access memory is a hardware component where the operating system, application programs, and data in current use I care so that it can be quickly reached by the computer's processor. Is it for majority of the books you see uh, random access memory or RAM is a hardware component that stores data and instructions temporary. This is not wrong, but it doesn't only do that, all right? RAM keeps the operating system, application programs, and data in current use. So, so long as you are using the thing, it's just in RAM. You can check this through your task manager. So, so long as the application is running, it's just in RAM. Because any application that you launch on your computer, anything you launch on the computer has to go into RAM before the processor can work on it. So anything at all you launch or you are using or is open at the moment as in RAM, some memory space has been both provided or given to that application. So it keeps them until you close them to so inherent use. But like I said, temporary is also not wrong, but I prefer inherent use because so long as you are using a pen as in RAM, immediately you finish, you close it, it goes out of RAM. So that's what the operating system does, allocation and then the allocation of memory. So we just saw uh, the RAM slot. A computer without a RAM will give off a beeping sound, yes, and the screen of the monitor will be blank. So this is also some small uh, PC diagnostics, which we'll look at uh, later, much later, and this tutorials that I'm doing, or I'm doing. So what you, also, what you have to know for now is that a computer without a RAM will give you a BPS because RAM is a vital component. So without it, you're not going to see anything on your screen because the operating system will not be loaded into the RAM if the RAM is not there or it is poor. The RAM has to be available if you see something on your screen. So there are two types of RAM. There's the static RAM and then the dynamic RAM. There is static RAM and then dynamic RAM. I won't go into details of this, but I want you to know that what is used in computers is a dynamic RAM. And then in the dynamic RAM is a double data rate for DDR1, DDR2, DDR3, DDR4. That's a double data rate. So dynamic RAM, you have the synchronous dynamic RAM, and now the RAM goes dynamic RAM. The synchronous or the uh, SRAM, and then the uh, Rumble's RAM are under dynamic RAM. But when you look at RAMs, then we have static RAM and then dynamic RAM. And when you go into dynamic RAM, then you're going to get a double data, the RAM boots and the synchronous, they are under dynamic RAM. But like I said, I'm going to details of it, but dynamic RAMs are RAMs or are the RAMs that are used in computers because they are not expensive as compared to static RAM. Static, static RAM are expensive because of how they work. But for dynamic RAM, they are affordable. So dynamic RAMs are the RAMs used in personal computers, and they are the RAMs that are, are upgradable. Are upgradable. CMOS chip and battery, they complementary metal oxide semiconductor. That's a full meaning anyway. It's a chip on the motherboard that contains BIOS configuration 
date, time, and other information that a computer needs during startup. The CMOS battery supplies power to the CMOS chip even when a computer is shut down. So basically, if you don't know anything at all about CMOS chip and battery, what I want you to know is your date and time is held in the CMOS chip. The CMOS battery, they're like your calculator battery and your watch batteries, they provide power to the CMOS chip so that when a computer is off, your date and time, as well as other configurations will still be intact. So the battery there provides or gives power to the CMOS chip. However, it is the CMOS chip that contains the date and time. So anytime you see wrong date, wrong time, then you should know that you have a problem with the battery because the battery is not able to supply power to the CMOS chip when it is off, when the computer is off. So when you change it, you see when you boot the computer and you change your date and time, it stays until another restart or when you shut down and you shut the, when you shut down and you put it back on. So you have to be doing it again over all over again because your CMOS battery is not able to provide battery, uh, power to the CMOS chip when you turn off the computer. So you may have to replace your CMOS battery. But yeah, the CMOS chip holds a date and time. So your date and time is held in the CMOS chip which is a complementary metal oxide semiconductor. And another component, again, very important, is a heat sink. Another component, again, is a heat sink. We can all agree that the CPU is a brain of the computer. If it is, then you know that the CPU does a lot of work. Is it, the CPU has to go through a number of cycles to process or to give us information. When you look at the information or data information processing cycle, you'll understand that the CPU goes through the sequences or steps to give us the information or the results that we need, making the CPU a very important component and then making the CPU, uh, making the CPU a very important. So because of this num these number of cycles that it goes through, it can really get hot or heated. Is it, the CPU has to go through a lot of cycles, a lot of number of cycles. Because of this number of cycles that a CPU goes through, it can really be hot or it can really get heated. So we need a device that would regulate or check or keep the CPU intact in terms of its hotness or how heated it can get. And then this device is a heat sink. So heat sink is a thermal conductive metal device designed to absorb and disperse heat away from a high temperature object such as a computer's processor. Or basically, basically, heat sink is a hardware component that absorbs and disperses heat away from the computer's processor. So either you are going with a thermal conductive metal design, device designed to absorb and disperse heat away from a high temperature object such as a computer's processor, or you say heat sink is a hardware component that absorbs and disperses heat away from the computer's processor. Now, ROM, read-only memory. Not, a long, not long ago, we saw, uh, or we, we, we discussed RAM. RAM is an internal storage, or let me say primary storage. ROM is so another primary storage. RAM, like we said, stores data instructions program and part of the operating system inherent use or temporary. However, ROM does something more than that. The opposite here is ROM source instructions permanently. So unlike RAM, ROM's instructions are kept permanently. So even if the machine goes off, even if there's power outage, the instructions that have been written to ROM are still there. They don't go away. And then I'll tell you why the instructions are still there because if you don't have the instructions there, basically you, there's no way to boot your device or your computer. So it is important that ROM's instructions stay even if the machine goes off or even if there's power outage. Right, so ROM is a type of storage medium that permanently stores software instructions also known as firmware needed to start up a personal computer and other electronic devices. So ROM holds the instructions that are needed to start up a computer. When you boot your computer, when you press the power button, you see some instructions for the power on self test and all the things, checking all devices connected to the machine, peripherals and in the internal components, if everything. 
uh, uh, think that or working. If it finds something that is not working, if it if it's vital component, it gives a beeping sound. If it is not vital, it still gives you a sound and then uh, tells you what is happening to you. For instance, if your CMOS battery is dead or it's not inside, it lets you know that your data time is wrong. And then uh, if you want to go ahead, you go into the BIOS and then you set the data inside, or you can press F1 or any other function key it allows you to press and then you move on from there. So run calls the instruction that is needed to start up the computer. What tells the computer what to do and how to do it when you press the power button? It's written to ROM. That is why it is important that ROM keeps these instructions permanently. So it's not unlike RAM, where whatever the user is doing is written to it. For ROM, it comes with a device. All the instructions that are needed to boot that computer, boot that mobile phone, comes with it. So it's not something that you can just take away and then put another thing back. Uh, ROM is very difficult to uh, delete or wipe its content and then put another thing. They are not saying that it's not possible. It's just possible when uh, ultraviolet light is involved. And uh, yes, but it's not something that you would want to do because it is not for the lay person or the layman to do. And it's not something that will even encourage you to indulge yourself in. So just like we have types of RAM, we have types of ROM as well. And then we have the PROM, which is programmable read only memory. Programmable read only memory is PROM. It's, it's for PROM, it can be programmed by a user, not just any user anyway, you have to agree with me. And then once programmed, the data and instructions and it cannot be changed. So that is PROM. And then we have another one, which is EPROM or erasable programmable read only memory, it can be reprogrammed. It means that it can erase the data or the instructions and then reprogram it. But like I said, it is not an easy thing or it's not for a layman. And then there is what? Electrically erasable, programmable, read only memory. So for EEPROM, you need to expose it to ultraviolet light or UV light. And then for EEPROM or electrically erasable, programmable read only memory. You don't necessarily need UV light to wipe its content. You just need an electric, electric field to wipe its content. But yes, these are not things that you would want to uh, involve yourselves in or with. But if your job allows you to do that, that's okay. But ROM is very important and you don't go messing with it. Then you have a hard disk drive. Yeah, before I even talk about a hard disk drive, you should know that ROM and RAM are primary storage media. Primary storage media. You have primary storage media and then secondary storage media. What you are seeing on your screen now is a secondary storage media. ROMs and RAMs are primary uh, primary storage media. So you should know that. All right, hard disk. Hard disk, hard disk drive or hard disk. And this is a familiar thing that you should know because some of you have external hard disk and you know what external hard disk are used for. They are no different from internal hard disks. Now, it is a permanent storage medium that stores all the software installed in a computer as well as all the data files created and used by the software. So the difference between the hard disk and then the RAM is the RAM stores the data instructions and current use all temporary. Then the hard disk stores the files permanently. So if you want to, if you launch a Microsoft Word, and you type something, whatever you are typing is being kept in RAM. So long as Microsoft on, Microsoft Word is still uh, active, but once you close it and then you click no for that dialog box that asks you whether you want to save or not, if you click no, it, when you close that application or the Microsoft Word application, it goes off from RAM because it's no more in current to you. So it is wiped from RAM. And then if you if you want to access whatever you type, you won't get it unless you redo everything. But with hard disk, or when you click on the save or you go to save as and you save it, it is now put on your hard disk. So anytime you want to visit that particular thing that you type in with Microsoft Word, you just have to click on it and then you get it and you can start or continue from wherever you left off. So that is a hard disk. Hard disk again also, 
stores your music, your videos, and any other file that you have on your computer or any personal file that you have on your computer is stored on a hard disk. It works like the way a flash drive works or even compact disks or DVDs or Blu-ray disks. So that is hard disk. It stores all these things permanently. When you run an operating system or an installation on your computer, the installation is written or stored on the hard disk. It's stored on the hard disk. So your operating systems are stored on the hard disk. When you move a RAM from one computer to the other, you won't get anything. You just get a temporary storage, but there'll be nothing on it. But when you remove a hard disk from one computer to the other, the file, the operating system, whatever was on that hard disk, automatically would be put on that, uh, 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 or would start with that new computer. So when you move a hard disk, you've moved everything. Or when you move a RAM, you've moved nothing. The hard disk, just like the RAM, and the ROM also has some component or parts. Right? For the RAMs and hard disks, for the RAMs and ROMs, you have types, but for the hard disk, we have components. And as you know that the solid state drives as well. So the components of hard disk, let's look at the components of hard disk. We have the first one to be flatter. We have the first one to be flatter. Now, the flatter is what stores the data. It is cylindrical or circular. It is what stores the data. As you can see in the image, that's that cylindrical thing there is a flatter. And the flatter is further divided into tracks and sectors. So data is stored on the flatter in terms of tracks and sectors. But basically, the flatter is what stores the data whatever data or files you have on your computer, that your music, that your movies and all of that are stored on the platter. So when you move from the platter, we have the spindle. The spindle is what spins the platter. Like I said, it's a circular or cylindrical uh, thing there, or component or part. So you need something to spin it and the spindle does that. So the spindle is responsible for spinning the platter. Then we have the read or write arm, the read or write arm. So the read or write arm, depending on what you're doing at a time, reads or writes data to and from the hard disk. So if you are reading data, then the read arm will read the data from the hard disk. If you are writing to the hard disk, then the write arm will write to the platter because that is what stores the data and the platter stores the data in tracks and sectors. Then we have the last component, which is the actuator. And now the actuator is what controls the actions of the read and write arm, basically. Optical disk drive. So an optical disk drive uses laser to read and write data to an optical disk. This is very simple. An optical disk drive uses laser to read and write data to an optical disk. Now, uh, my students, they make this mistake and I want to believe that it cuts across or it runs through, but you don't say CD-ROM or DVD-ROM. The technical name is optical text drive because we have optical text drives that take both CD and then DVD. Previously, or those days, or years, or in the past, computers came with either CDs or DVD-ROMs or uh, slots for you to put CD or DVD. Some computers also came with both, where you have one at the top as a slot that takes a CD, and then the down is a slot that takes DVD. Now the computers that we have, you have only one uh, slot, but takes both CDs and then DVDs. So you don't say CD room or DVD room. The technical name is optical text drive. Now the optical text drive can take compact text or can take digital video disk. So optical disk drive is a technical name for a CD room or a DVD room. Now for the CDs, you have compact disk, rewritable, compact disk, recordable, and then we have digital video disk, rewritable, digital video disk, recordable, and then there's Blu-ray. All these are uh, secondary storage media, like the hard disk, they store data or files permanently. The disks or the CDs are also useful in running operating systems. So if you want to run a new operating system, you can use the CDs or the DVDs as well as flash drives to do that. Now, motherboard, motherboard, a very important component. 
And in fact, without a motherboard there will be no computer, without a motherboard there will be no mobile device, mobile phone, and without a motherboard, in fact, without a motherboard there will be no electronic device. So the motherboard is a very important component of the computer system. Now, a motherboard is an electronic circuit board in a computer which interconnects hardware devices attached to it. So a motherboard interconnects hardware devices attached to it. The hard disk, the optical disk drive, the CPU, your keyboard, your mouse, the, I mean, everything on the computer is on the motherboard. Your transistors, your capacitors, your CMOS chip, your ROM, your RAM, your RAM slot, your PCIs, every other component we've looked at are on the, uh, uh, every other component we've looked at is on the motherboard. And those we've not even looked at, they are all on the motherboard. So the motherboard is very important, very, very, very important because without it, like I said, there will be no device for you to use. It controls all these things that are attached to it. So one, it interconnects hardware devices attached to it. And then second, it is in communication. It is in communication on the board. If you do computer engineering, you be taught how to read motherboards on the board. There are bus lines or system buses, and then these bus lines aid communication signals move through these bus lines using the control bus, the address bus, and then the data bus. So this is how communication happens between the CPU and the memory, as well as other components and peripherals. So when you when you slot in a pen drive or a flash drive, when you slot in a CD or DVD. They have some, some communication because the CPU has to be able to read that data from that CD and the CPU has to be able to read that data on that flash drive. So you need that uh, the bus lines and then the system buses. The bus line is just a pathway and then the system buses like the control bus, the data bus, and the address bus, depending on what you are doing, help you to move this data. And then, so other names for this electronic circuit board, uh, you have system board, you have main board and then you have printed wired board. Now we are done with the hardware components and their functions, not all of them, but we are done with the basic ones that will be or is required of you to know the very basic ones. But I want you to know that we have vital components, vital components in the system unit. It means that when these components are not there, you can't do anything with a computer. And then the vital components, let me just run you through them. We have the uh, CPU, very vital. Let me see, when I mentioned the motherboard, I've mentioned everything, so I'll take the motherboard out. So the CPU, a very vital component. Without a CPU, you can't do anything. The power supply, a very vital component. Without a power supply, you can't do anything. The power supply unit, you can't do anything. The RAM, a very vital component. Without a RAM, you can see anything on your screen. The ROM, a vital component, of course. Without a ROM, no instructions needed to start a computer will be there in the first place. Then the heat sink. But without a heat sink, the computer will boot all right. But you're not going to give you 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 not you not enjoy the computer because once the CPU becomes hot or heats up, the computer would shut down. So you're going to get frequent shutdowns or freezes. So yes, the heat sink do not really vital because you can put the computer without it. You see, there are vital components that without them, you can boot the computer. But without a heat sink, you can boot the computer. Right? But just that you won't get to, uh, you don't get to enjoy the computer because they're going to have frequent freezes and shutdowns. So the heat sink, well, because you can boot the computer, you can't necessarily turn this as a vital component, but it is. It is a vital component. So without uh, optical disk, you can boot the computer. So you can turn optical disk as a vital component. With hard disk, internal hard disk is a vital component. In fact, the operating system is on the hard disk. So without a hard disk, yes, the ROM will work. You are going to get that instruction, which uh, will tell the computer uh, to boot. But you can't go further because the hard disk that holds the operating system is not there. So without a hard disk, you can't also go further. So yes, the hard disk in this case, is a vital component. So these vital components, basically, you should know that without them, you don't get to see your uh, starting windows or your desktop. That's the point. You don't get to see it. Without a CMOS battery, 
you can still boot your machine. The date and time which has been wrong, but you can use your machine. You just have to change it every time you boot your machine. So yes, these are the vital components that we have in the system unit. I'm not sure I've been able to mention all, but yes, the ones that I've mentioned are vital components. Then we have some terms associated with the workings of the CPU. Some terms associated with the workings of the CPU. We have one as a memory. A memory address is the number assigned to each byte in a computer's memory that a CPU uses to track where data and instructions are stored in RAM. Each byte is assigned a memory address, whether or not it is being used to store data. The computer CPU uses the address bus to communicate to communicate which memory address it wants to access and the memory controller reads the address and then puts the data stored in that memory address back onto the address bus for the CPU to use in the control bus. So a control bus is a computer bus that is used by the CPU to communicate with devices that are contained within the computer. This occurs through physical connections such as keyboards or printed circuits. So basically the CPU uses the control bus to communicate all the devices. Then we have the data bus. The data bus, so data bus is a bi-directional pathway that carries data between the processor or the CPU and other components in the computer system. So that's bi-directional. This is bi-directional. It carries data between the processor and other components in the computer system. Then there is another one, which is the address bus. So address bus carries memory addresses from the processor to other components such as primary storage and input and output devices. They have a clock speed, which I'll leave it for you to find out because clock speed is something that you should know. So I'll leave the clock speed for you to find out. But again, it's important because if you are going to buy a computer, you need to know the clock speed and then you should know that this is measured in gigahertz. So if you're going to buy a computer, you need a clock speed, you need to know the RAM, and the hard disk, of course, you need to store for also the hard disk, the size of the hard disk also matters. And then, um, yes, well, the inches of the screen, depending on what you want to do with this. And then the ports, again, depending on what you want to do, the HDMI, and your VGA, and then you want more USB ports. So yes, we are doing hardware, I'm giving all this stuff, but in PC diagnostics, look at all these things proper. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, I'll see you soon. We we'll come to the end of computer uh, hardware component one. Like I said, there'll be hardware components two, or there is hardware component two, which I'll find time and then bring it to you. Try to hands on these questions. Do the function of the following so you have them there. Try your hands on. If you need to go back to watch the video, pause, just do it. Anything you think you can do to understand, you just have to do it. Again, leave comments. If there's something that you need to further explain, you can send me email, you can leave it in the comment section, and then I'll do all that. I'm here for you. I want you to understand electric devices. I mean, the importance of IT cannot be overemphasized. So I need you to understand it, love it. And then again, you have to check the description of the videos as well. I'll put all the notes you need there so that you can write there, sit down, learn there, and don't you import, just understand. So that you can produce it wherever you find yourself. It's important that you understand because all these things are understandable. All right, so thank you for watching. Our next tutorials will be on hardware component two. Subscribe and keep the channel active. Let others know. Yeah, even though uh, it's taking me longer than I expected uh, videos or than you and I expected to do videos, I'm still doing the videos. So you can tell others to subscribe and then just be ready. You can turn on notifications so that once I upload a video, you know it or YouTube will notify you and you can watch it, learn, and then do whatever you want to do. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Until then, it's bye for now.